This morning I was trying to convince you that dark matter is there and that it has various properties. Now I want to move to the question of uh, models of dark matter. Um, as I was starting with this morning, uh, there are a lot of different models. And what I want to do overall with these lectures is try to go into some detail in some specific cases, some more than others. Um, but one thing that I would like to achieve, because one thing I think that is good uh, about these summer schools is that you hear even the very basics about a particular model, and then somebody goes and gives a talk about it, and at the very least, when they start talking about it, you can say, okay, I at least know what that is that they're talking about. So before we get into any details of models, I want to go through and just give you sort of like very, very brief summaries of a lot of different models that you may or may not hear about. You may already know some of them. You may not know some of them. Uh, to give them, you at least that amount of context uh, so that you go into a talk that somebody starts with knowing at least something of what they're talking about. And obviously, some of these I will go into in significantly more detail. Now, the critical questions that you have to keep in mind anybody time anybody talks about any model of dark matter, um, you want to ask, what is it? Like, literally, what is the field theory that you're writing down? How does it fit into Lagrangian? Uh, what motivates it? Why did somebody ever start talking about this particular model? Um, what constrains it? Are there experimental constraints? Are there cosmological constraints? What's out there that tells me uh, what it can be? Uh, why is it stable, at least on cosmological times? What has prevented it from decaying? And is it dead? All right. It's an important thing to uh, ask. Uh, as I don't know who said, but somebody has said, uh, you know, theories never die, only theorists die. Um, so anyhow. So let's begin with um, some of these models. The first one uh, is, and again, these will be the sum that I'll go into in much more detail later, but just so that we're all on the same page with all of them. Let's start with the axion. So what is it? What is the axion? So in the standard model, we have the strong CP problem that you can write down a parameter in your Lagrangian, uh, uh, a CP violating term in your Lagrangian, which is GG dual. Uh, this is uh, not forbidden by any symmetry except for CP, but CP is broken by the standard model in the quark sector. Uh, and so there's no symmetry in the standard model that can tell you this should be zero. Experimental constraints on the neutron EDM tell you that this should be less than 10 to the minus 11. And you have to ask, why is that the case? And so the axion essentially promotes this to a dynamical variable. And this parameter A becomes your axion. This A is the field. F is the uh, axion decay constant. This needs to be a very, very light uh, field. And the idea is that QCD instanton effects generate a potential of this combination of parameters that has a minimum at this being equal to 0. So. The system wants to relax to a point where the axion cancels off theta bar, and as a consequence, uh, the strong CP problem is solved. Uh, this is tested by a lot of experiments, uh, astrophysical experiments, uh, cosmological experiments, and terrestrial experiments, and we'll talk about those in detail. So that's the axion. This is the level I want to just kind of go through these different models. Neutralino. You've already heard a great deal about Suzy, so I don't know exactly what how he has gone into, but I'm sure he has talked about neutralinos. So this will be quick. No? Yes? OK. Well, I will talk about neutralinos. So in the standard model, you have four scalar or vector. We have four boson, neutral bosons. You have the hypercharge boson, the third component of uh, W bosons, and the Higgs up and Higgs down. This, sorry, this is in, this, in, in the standard model. You just have this. When you go to supersymmetry, you need to add an additional Higgs boson. So in supersymmetry, you have four neutral bosons. And so the magic of supersymmetry is that you put tildes on everything. And now that means that I have four eigenstates.
Um, so the, the interaction eigenstates are the Bino, Wino, and up and down Higginos, but I actually have a mass matrix which mixes them all up. So I have four states. These are my neutralinos. And in principle, the lightest one of these things can be stable if Susie has R parity, which you can approximately think of as a parity where you flip the sign of all of your superpartners and keep the sign of all standard model fields the same, which is useful for forbidding dangerous baryon lepton number operators. If so, then the lightest R parity odd particle, the lightest supersymmetric particle, is stable. And if that is the neutralino, then, uh, then this gives you a dark matter candidate. Uh, the motivation for this is obviously the hierarchy problem. So the motivation for Susie is then the motivation for this. Um, this is an example of a weakly interacting massive particle. So when we talk about tests for WIMPs, all those tests for WIMPs will be applicable to the neutralino. Um, it is alive. Um, most of the constraints on it come from other tests of SUSY parameter space. And I'll just make one more point, which is that although this is the neutralino that I'm going to mostly talk about here, you can obviously add arbitrary additional neutral singlet fermions. Anything that is neutral under the standard model, I can add them and take any linear combination. And as long as the lightest one of them uh, is R parity odd, that will be a uh, a neutralino. So all I'm saying is that without these, you're just talking about the MSSM neutralino, but as you add additional singlinos, uh, you're still talking about a neutralino. It's just a one in, not, that's not in the MSSM. Next. Snutrino. Um, so the snutrino is, again, analogous to this. You start in the standard model with the neutrino. You supersymmetrize it. You add a tilde. You now have uh, these stable fields. If the lightest supersymmetric particle were a snutrino, then that would, in principle, be a dark matter candidate. It is motivated by the hierarchy problem, and it is tested by WIMP searches. And this neutrino actually, as, as it turns out, is pretty much dead. Um, so when you ask why people don't talk about the snutrino, it's because it's, it's, it's pretty dead by direct detection. Um, there are some, some twists that you can do to get around that. But at least if I just told you, here's the MSSM and here's this neutrino, that would have been tested by uh, direct detection experiments a long time ago. On the other hand, there is the mixed neutrino. So you might say, well, I have a left-handed neutrino. And so what is that? That is that you take the, the, the left-handed neutrino and you put in a right-handed neutrino. Uh, and in doing that, you now have additional freedom to play with. You have the ability to change the relic abundance. And to the extent that your dark matter is more right-handed neutrino than left-handed neutrino, you can dial down its interactions to the standard model and make the theory uh, safe again. And there are different ways to do that. So these are both WIMPs. They are both motivated by the hierarchy problem. They are both stable by R parity. And they are tested by WIMP searches. I'll, I'll talk about that a little. I mean, I'll, I'll go into much more detail about the neutralino in particular. Not as much, maybe, as some people might say uh, I should, but I'll definitely go to it. Um, um, if you are in a generic region of parameter space, um, then combinations, it, it depends on what parameters you like. Um, Higginos, things that are dominantly Higginos should have masses that are around a TeV. Things that are dominantly Wino should have a mass that are around 3 TeV. And the Bino, being something that on its own does not really have any interesting couplings to the standard model, except with other supersymmetric particles, uh, depends much more on the parameter space that you're, that you're living in. We'll talk a little bit about, about this. Um, there is, a, there is a, something called the well-tempered neutralino, where you take sort of a roughly order one mixture of these things. And so for a few hundred GeV particle, it, it, it has the appropriate WIMP properties. Um, next. Next is the sterile neutrino. Um, the sterile neutrino, what is it? Well, if you want to have neutrino mass, then you need to have a right-handed, you need to be able to write down 
some higher dimension operator or some beyond the standard model operator for neutrino masses. A very, very simple way to write down a neutrino mass is to imagine that you have a right-handed neutrino and and if you do that, you can have a left-right mass between the sterile neutrino and the active neutrino. Um, but if this is really a standard model singlet, there's nothing to tell you why you can't have a Majorana mass for the right-handed neutrino on its own. Okay? So you diagonalize this mass matrix, and you end up with eigenvalues, which are approximately m Dirac squared over m right right and m right right. And what people usually say is, well, I'm going to take m right right to be the gut scale. It's going to be very, very heavy. And I'm going to understand the smallness of the neutrino mass as a ratio between a weak scale and a very, very high scale. But it doesn't have to be the case. This Dirac mass could be very, very small. And this right-handed mass scale could also be relatively small. And if you do that, then there's the possibility that this right-handed neutrino could be stable, or at least stable on cosmological times, and could be the um, uh, constitute the dark matter. Uh, this is formed through neutrino oscillations between active and sterile in the early universe, at least in the simplest production mechanisms. And for neutrino masses around KEV, or sorry, right-handed neutrino masses around KEV, uh, they give you a good dark matter candidate uh, consistent with existing bounds. So what motivates this is probably, I'd say, the simplest way to motivate this would be minimality. We know that there are neutrino masses. You have to do something about them. So why not take the thing that is you're doing to solve explain neutrino masses and see what else it can do for you? It can be dark matter, right? Why add copious new fields for every problem when you can solve two problems with one uh, field? Um, it's tested by a combination of uh, structure formation and or Lyman alpha data and um, X-ray data. So very, very heavy neutrinos, or sorry, right-handed neutrinos, uh, decay and produce X-rays, whereas ones that are too light are too warm and are in conflict with observations of structure. There is a window between that in sort of the KEV range uh, that is still alive. And indeed, as we hopefully will talk about on Wednesday, uh, people even claim that there is some indication that such a particle could have been discovered in X-ray data. So. Yeah. Aren't right-handed neutrinos standard models? Yes. So how would they annihilate? Um, they're, 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 th these are not actually so much annihilating. What you do is, in the early early-ish universe, so at sort of temperatures that are above the mass of this neutrino, what happens is you produce an active neutrino. So the, the state that you couple to is an active eigenstate. It's the thing that couples to W bosons. But the thing that couples to W bosons is not a mass eigenstate, right? So once you produce it, essentially there's oscillations between the sterile and active, um, and there's some scattering processes that then decohere that and collapse you into either being an active or sterile case. So there's some net production process that produces these right-handed neutrinos uh, from the fact that, I should say, I'm not really necessarily, I'm not saying I'm producing right-handed neutrinos, I'm producing left-handed neutrinos that are then linear combinations of two eigenstates. And so sometimes I'm going to get the heavy eigenstate, which is dominantly sterile neutrino. Yeah. Uh, for, the, for the mixing parameters that are relevant for this, they do not. The sterile neutrinos that are constrained by oscillation experiments are generally much lighter with larger mixing angles. This, I mean, if you think about this as a baseline, this would be a, this is a very, very, very high mass. Uh, so you're talking about a very, very short baseline. Well, we'll talk about what we mean by thermal dark matter in a second. Uh, some people would say this is a thermally produced dark matter particle, and some people would say this is not a thermal dark matter. So let's, let's hold off on that terminology for a second. Yeah. Uh, so when you usually talk about it for dark matter, you're usually talking about one. Um, usually, as in all these cases, you'll assume that you have probably, if you really want to explain neutrino masses, you need at least two. If you have some idea that you really like symmetry, then you could say you have three. Although I should point out that the fact that you're calling this a right-handed neutrino is really just the same sense in which you call the right-handed electron an electron. Prior to electroweak symmetry breaking, it had totally different charges from the left-handed electron. And the only reason that you decided to call it an electron, both of them the same thing, was because they got a mass mixing. 
and then you decided, okay, I'm going to call this the same particle because if I produce one, it can turn into the other. But at high energies, those things are just totally different Lyell spinners. So similarly here, these things are logically could be unrelated particles, and, um, uh, and it's only through this mass mixing that um, I start thinking of them as both neutrinos. Um, if I want to explain all the neutrino masses, I need at least two. Uh, if I want to explain dark matter, I only need one. Um, yeah. Oh. Oh, well, the superpartner of this one is actually like that uh, in the mixed neutrino case. Um, and then it's a question about how large your uh, Yukawa couplings are, which one is produced, which one of them is, is uh, and, and how massive it is. This, one is. this one is only really a dark matter candidate in, in this mass range. So if I, for instance, made the right-handed neutrino TeV in mass, then I would only care about this neutrino. It's, it's the lower bound by the warm bound. It's, it's, yeah, so the lower bound comes from the warm dark matter limits, yeah. and the upper bound comes from searches for x rays. So really yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuse me? No, this is not going to kill by ineffective. Uh, so by ineffective, you mean the, the number of relativistic degrees of freedom. Uh, so since this is a KEV mass state at, uh, at the recombination, uh, the, where the temperature is EV, this thing is, 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 I mean, as all dark matter particles should be, this thing is acting cold from KEV on. So it's acting like dark matter from KEV on. Good. Next. Next is the L top. This is the lightest T odd particle. I'll discuss this in a second. Uh, this is a this is a uh, a weakly interacting massive particle in general. Uh, it appears in various solutions to the hierarchy problem. Usually, it's most oftenly discussed in the context of little Higgs theories, uh, where there's an additional T parity symmetry in them, uh, which I'll I'll discuss in a second. Um, it's not a really a specific model. It's not even as specific a model as say the neutralino is, which is still a pretty general scenario. Um, in any specific model, you can pick out a particle which could be the lightest t odd particle and see whether it can be dark matter. So most of the constraints on this come from the constraints of the Little Higgs theories. And as you heard from Chaba, Little Higgs theories are, are very, very constrained at this point. Next. Yeah, all, all these particles are neutral particles. Um, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Next is KK dark matter. So you also heard from Chaba that in extra dimensions, you have a Kaluza-Klein tower of, of, of extra states. And if, very, very, very importantly, if you have an extra symmetry, that can stabilize one of these states, then the lightest kaluza klein particle can be dark matter. Uh, usually, it's an excited state of a neutrino or an excited state of the hypercharged gauge boson. Um, extra dimensional models, especially the universal extra dimension models where all the standard model fields propagate, um, are very, very constrained by LHC data at this point. But in principle, these things can still be alive. Next, Axino. You loved what? Sorry, that. Usually, I mean it. So um, you can somewhat motivate it by getting rid of some bad operators, but usually, in ex but, but in general, no. This is a, the, the, the kaluza klein parity, uh, when you actually get into the details, so for, at least for the universal extra dimension models, um, I'm not talking about warp models. I'm really just talking about the, the UED models here. What you have to do is you have to compactify on some, 
something, say a circle, right? But then you orbifold it so you have your two endpoints, which are fixed points. And then you need to have a, a symmetry which relates the properties and interactions on both of those, um, of those endpoints uh, to get this, um, uh, get this KK parity. So it's not really a, a, a it's not really a symmetry of the Lagrangian uh, as it much as it is a symmetry of the the. As you know, the momentum in the fifth dimension looks like mass. Um, but in principle, and, and when you put in these um, brains on the edges of the space, those things are breaking your higher dimensional uh, Poincaré group down. Uh, because you, you basically have stuck something in space, right? Okay, so that explicitly is breaking it. But in principle, you can still have an even odd, uh, uh, you can have a, a, a reflection type symmetry. Uh, but you have to do a little bit more than that. You have to do a reflection and an exchange symmetry of these two endpoints. Uh, uh, it's not just about the boundary conditions you're placing on the states. It's about making sure that you don't have any additional interactions that uh, that, that can allow you to um, change even number of KK states into odd number of KK states. Yeah. In in large extra dimensions, um, well. In large extra dimensions, you still can have TeV mass particles, right? Your cutoff is TeV, so it's very, very natural that you would have additional TeV mass particles in your theory that could be stable. Um, uh, the extra dimensional states themselves are not going to be good dark matter candidates because they're, they're, they're too light. And their production mechanism is usually you're trying to prevent the thermalization of, of the KK modes uh, in large extra dimension theories. So next is the axino. So you loved supersymmetry when we first introduced it. You loved axions when we introduced them. If you love both, why not love everything? Um, so the axino is a natural consequence. It should be there, right? Um, so you take the axion of solving the strong CP problem and in SUSY, you now have it converted to this. So this is your axion. But in supersymmetry, there should also be a scalar part, a saxion, which is unstable. And then you have the axino. Um, if this is the LSP or NLSP for a certain adequately high uh, decay constants, this can be a dark matter candidate. It can stretch over. Uh, a wide range of masses. So you can have KeV up to GeV or even 100 GeV mass axinos. Um, so this is stable either because it is the lightest superpartner or because its decay constant is sufficiently large that it's stable on cosmological times. It's motivated by the combination of, of uh, uh, of the hierarchy problem and the strong CP problem. Um, it's a little difficult to test. Sometimes decaying axinos can be tested. If, so if it's an unstable axino, you can test that and look for its decay products. Um, uh, but it is a, is a tricky, it can be a tricky particle to look for because uh, it has a very, very wide range of masses that it can be. And that's because its production mechanism is dependent on the temperature of reheating from inflation. So uh, that makes it harder to pin down. But it's certainly a very, very motivated um, theory. If you want to solve, if you believe both of these problems should be solved, then there's no reason why you shouldn't think about what happens when you solve them simultaneously. Um, in a similar vein, the gravitino is a, um, a dark matter particle. Again, you take Susie. You love Susie. You love gravity. It should be present in your theory. Um, it is, of course, extremely weakly interacting, um, and getting something which actually satisfies the relic abundance constraints can be tricky, um, but it's motivated, and it is mostly something that you can look for by looking for 
the decay products of heavier particles decaying into the gravitino and looking at their impacts on cosmology. But it's otherwise very difficult to pin down. And it's stable because of R parity. There is something called inert doublet dark matter. The idea of inert doublet dark matter is to take something that looks like a Higgs boson. So that's an SU2 doublet with hypercharge 1 half, a scalar. But you don't give it any Yukawa couplings, and you don't allow it to get a VEV, because either one of those things would allow this thing to, to decay. So that object uh, is a reasonable WIMP. In general, you need to add a, uh, an operator for reasons involving direct detection, uh, which looks something like LH squared, which breaks inert doublet number down to a Z2 parity. Uh, and I'll talk about what that operator is for. But this model is a standard WIMP. You can look for it in standard WIMP searches. So that is direct detection, indirect detection, and collider searches. Um, and the motivation for it would be something along the lines of, we've seen one doublet. What happens if we saw another one? I'm, I'm writing down a terminal Lagrangian. Oh, yeah, L is inert doublet. Let me call it. I write an L because it has the same charges as a lepton, a left-handed lepton. Well, I'm coupling this to, uh, I'm contracting this with the Higgs here. So I'm contracting their SU2 indices so that this is a, so this is a, a full uh, standard model singlet. And then I'm squaring that. So there's a Z2 left over from this that allows the thing to be stable. ZZ decays? Uh, well, so, so this operator here allows a parity under which I goes to minus I. So it should be stable at the end of the day. Okay? Even when the Higgs gets a VEV, this thing will remain stable. Yeah, it has gauge coupling. No, no, because that the ZZ I term is when you have a non-inert doublet, right? That's from when you put in the Higgs VEV. But that actually is a very good point. That's that's the motivation for considering an inert doublet is to precisely avoid those sorts of of uh, interactions. Okay. Is it a scalar or is it a fermion? It's a scalar. It's a scalar. You can write down something analogous for a fermion that I don't know of as having a name. Then it looks very much like a fourth generation neutrino, because this thing has the same quantum numbers as a, a lepton. And you involve a similar sort of question of writing down an operator that looks vaguely like this, except for this is a dimension four operator. So I can write it down in theory. Whereas the equivalent operator I want to write down with the fermion is a dimension five operator. Um, and you, you also need that operator for making the theory phenomenologically viable in the leptonic case. So the leptonic case, if, or sorry, the fermionic case. So the fermionic case would require you to add yet another field in order to write down higher dimension operators. So this one is at least totally self-contained. It'll be, this, 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 this discussion will be a bit easier when we get to questions of direct detection. Next is asymmetric dark matter. Asymmetric dark matter um, is, is a slightly vague term at this point. The original idea for asymmetric dark matter was to imagine that your dark matter actually carried away the baryon number, okay? So you have, you look at your universe, there's a certain amount of baryon number in it, you imagine that dark matter carries is sort of where that baryon number went, right? So you look around yourself, the baryon to photon ratio tells me that omega baryon is 0 0.04. Uh, so if you want to do baryogenesis, you need to have some baryon number violation. Um, but you could imagine that the way that worked out was that the universe took some and put the, the, the uh, if, if dark matter carries baryon number, then I can have a net baryon number zero universe where it's just sequestered into two different sectors. And in this case, you end up with a statement where the mass of the dark matter divided by the mass of the baryon is just the ratio of dark matter to a baryon. 
Now, that has evolved um, for a variety of reasons. Our thinking about this has evolved for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which is the idea of sphalerons, means that we don't actually believe that baryon number is entirely tied up just in baryons. We know that baryon number should be mixed with lepton number. So now, uh, this is more that the number density of dark matter should be, or the, the, uh, the dark matter number that's present in the universe should be approximately that of baryon number, in which case this, instead of being a, an equality, is now just sort of an approximation. Um, both of these have the motivation of explaining a question, which is, you look around yourself, and in principle, the dark matter energy density and the baryonic energy density, omega baryon and omega dark matter, could be entirely different. So why are they even within spitting distance of one another? And asymmetric dark matter says, well, the reason that they're comparable is because they're both approximately GeV-ish mass particles to 100 GeV mass particles, and they share a quantum number. And so it's natural that they should end up with um, uh, energy densities, which are then comparable. Um, this has now evolved a bit more, where I think even ideas where the number density of dark matter is epsilon times the baryon number would now be considered an asymmetric model. Um, and and that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's no, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just something that comes out of some scenarios where most of the baryon number ends up in baryons and only a little bit of it ends up in dark matter. Um, but of course, at this point, you're starting to get away from this motivation. You're really now just starting to talk about a broader class of theories. And um, even more, more uh, generically, people will use asymmetric dark matter to simply refer to this requirement. Sometimes people will say dark matter is asymmetric and they will mean nothing about baryon number whatsoever. They will simply mean that dark matter itself has an asymmetry, that the number of dark matter does not equal the number of anti-dark matter. So, uh, so asymmetric dark matter has a variety of, of meanings, uh, so you should always be clear on context of what people are talking about. And of course they have a variety of motivations. Uh, some of them are to try to solve this coincidence problem. Some of them are just simply trying to understand why did you not deplete all the dark matter, right? So you could have models where the dark matter would have entirely annihilated itself away, except for that it preserved itself by the presence of some primordial asymmetry, which came from somewhere else. And these are all reasonable models to think about. That's right. That's right. That's what that would be. Next, we have something which doesn't have a very good name at this point, but we call you can call them dark force models or dark sector models or secluded models. Um, the idea here is that you have a dark sector and then you have your standard model and you have say your fermions over here and then you have various things like your Higgs and you have your gauge bosons, in particular hypercharge gauge boson and then in your dark sector you'll have your dark matter which could be a fermion or a scalar and then you have some some either scalar or dark photon, A prime, or phi. And then there's some mixing here, which could be, for instance, a kinetic mixing between the dark hypercharge, the dark U1, and ordinary hypercharge. Or it could be something like a, a scalar mixing, if you assume that you have something which gets a VEV in the dark sector and the Higgs gets a VEV over here, there'll be a mass mixing. And if that's the case, then you have the possibility of a situation where dark matter talks to the standard model, but it does not talk to the standard model directly. So for instance, dark matter can annihilate into A primes 
A primes can be produced through interactions with standard model fermions. And so even though the dark matter does not itself directly talk to the standard model, it does stay in either thermal equilibrium uh, with the standard model through this mixing process. And we'll talk a little bit more about those, and you'll have a number of lectures by Maxime Pospilov on, on these things in particular. Next, black holes. So black holes are every particle physicist's nemesis because we always like to go around and say, uh, look, dark matter has to be some state that does not exist in the standard model. But black holes are certainly a state that exists in the standard model as long as your standard model includes gravity. Uh, so it's not a particle state, but it is a definitely a state that should exist. Um, and there are a lot of limits on black holes. And there is a separate question about how you produce these black holes. Because as we know, omega baryon should be 0 0.04. And we've tested that at recombination. We've tested that at temperatures of an MeV. So it's not like you can have a lot of baryons that stick around, make a star, and then turn that into a black hole, and then they're dark matter today. No. These black holes had to be made at times before any of that happened, so that they were already black holes at a KeV temperature. Okay? And that means that you need to usually, at least in the scenarios I know, make them primordially at the end of inflation or in some process of inflation. And there are reasonable models of inflation that do that, these hybrid inflation models in particular. Uh, but you do need extra fields. These are sort of additional ingredients to, to make these things happen. Their limits, this is a plot that I stole from Carr. That's not stealing, I'm borrowing. Um, and uh, on the x-axis here is the log of, log of the black hole mass divided by grams, which is, you know, who uses grams? And then here is fraction. Uh, where 10 to the 0 is all of the dark matter, and then this is 10 to the minus 8 of the dark matter. So if you want this to be the dark matter, you should be looking at that top 10 to the 0 line. And as you can see, there are a lot of limits on here. The red lines come from uh, various types of lensing observations, for instance, like the Macho experiment, looking for microlensing. But there are other types of lensing, empto lensing and pico lensing of GRBs. Um, there are constraints coming from this is like disk heating, dynamical friction. The greens ones are more astrophysical limits on what dark matter would do to the stuff that you see. Um, there are arguments that the production of, of these primordial black holes should lead to some gravitational waves, which eliminates this blue part here. And uh, for reference, uh, I put a line here at 2 times 10 to the 33 grams, which is the mass of the sun, just so you can kind of have a context here. So this would be a solar mass black hole here. And so you kind of have a range around solar mass-ish where it's sort of borderline from at least the lensing limits um, whether this is a viable model. And I don't know if after the LIGO paper came out, so this is the LIGO mass here, 30 solar masses, uh, but there was this uh, paper by um, various people, Ali Hamoud, uh, Elias Kolas, Mark Hemiankowski, and people I'm forgetting, I'm a terrible person for forgetting them, um, whether or not uh, uh, you could actually have dark matter at 30 solar masses, whether those could be uh, dark matter. Uh, mostly you run into these constraints, these blue constraints, which come from the CMB. There's distortions, there's limits that come from the distortion of the fact that the CMB is a very good black body, and uh, constraints on the consequences for the CMB um, uh, oscillation plot itself. Um, that comes from one particular paper in 2007, and it was raised in the uh, Ali Hamoud et al. paper that actually maybe uh, uh, there are reasons to think that those uh, constraints are significantly weaker than, than was first put down. So uh, let's just put this under the category of black holes in this mass is an open question, which seems to have some constraints that definitely need to be understood. Um, but you know, you should never. An important lesson is never let one paper discourage you from thinking about uh, a model. Um, but even so, there is this mass range down here where you can have black holes. Uh, and in a lot of that mass range, in principle, um, there is a paper by 
Alan Adams and Josh Bloom, where they look at whether or not LISA and future gravitational wave detectors could test that. So from a particle physicist point of view, these black holes are a real challenge because we want to get up here and say it has to be a new particle beyond the standard model, but we don't actually know it has to be a new particle beyond the standard model. It could be a black hole. On the other hand, you need new particles beyond the standard model to make them. So the logical con uh, content is still um, is new. But uh, huh? Well, but so the point is that if I, I can do inflation with a single field, but I don't know how to make primordial black holes with single field inflation. I need at least two fields. So at that level, I've had to add an additional particle, an additional field to my theory in order to make them. It's not TV scale. I'm just saying that from a sort of like parameter counting, degree of freedom counting, I did have to add a degree of freedom in order to do this. So I haven't necessarily saved myself anything at that level. What I've saved myself is the fact that my low energy theory doesn't have any new degrees of freedom. I don't know if that's actually more minimal or not. Um, good. There's something called a cue ball. So you're all familiar with um, solitons and topologically stable objects. So there's some topological number that keeps things stable, like a winding number or something like this. Uh, cue balls are non-topological solitons. And they've gone through a lot of iterations. What you need is you need usually a very flat scalar potential. Um, and you can create a field configuration, which is stable because it carries a very, very large charge, and it's Q, so this ball of stuff carries a very, very large Q, and it's stable because in order for this thing to decay, it would have to spit out a state of Q, and there are no, in general, no light states that carry charge Q that you can decay into. So this thing ends up being stable uh, for that reason. Um, I don't really know enough about these models to be able to tell you in general how to test them, um, but they do show up in supersymmetric theories uh, in particular. And the last one that I'm going to discuss right now, anyway, because I'm really just trying to show, throw words at you so that when people say this model, you know at least what they're talking about. The last one is a framework called Wimpless. And WIMPless will be a little bit easier to understand when we describe WIMPs, because we haven't described WIMPs, but there's a connection between WIMPs and WIMPless, where in WIMPs, you have a cross-section which is like 1 over mw squared, and the idea of WIMPless is that you can have a situation where there's some coupling constant in the numerator, which could be very small, and it could appear in a compensating fashion in the denominator. And so you could end up with something, even though it's not really a WIMP, it could end up with a cross-section that looks a lot like a WIMP. So you can have particles with masses which are very far away from the weak scale. This will become a little bit clearer when I talk about WIMPs, obviously, since this is defined as a contrast to WIMPs. Questions about these things? The G squared. Oh, um, so it, the idea is that you have a mass scale which scales with G and a coupling constant that scales with G so that the overall cross-section of the state still looks like one over weak scale, even though the actual mass scales of the problem are not that. In general, the, the mass scale is much lower. Yeah, yeah so Bose-Einstein condensate, again, this is a situation where you're talking about a uh, not a specific uh, um, uh, set up, but uh, sort of a framework of things. And sometimes you have models like the axion, when people claim that the axion could exist in a Bose-Einstein condensate phase. Um, I don't have a lot to say about them as a general class of things. I think that usually it's more on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, sometimes those models can give you some interesting new interactions or properties of dark matter. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a short answer to tell you about them in general. So, also, can you say something about like uh, blue balls or white nuggets? Yeah. What do I want to say? Well, so glue balls, in general, can decay. 
not always, but in general. Quark nuggets are Quark, I mean, these are interesting. I mean, I, no, no, I, I don't, I'm not trying to say anything at all. These are sort of like, when you start looking at the dynamics of uh, interesting field theories, then in the same sense that you can see cue balls, uh, you can start finding these sorts of stable objects that, that exist in them. Um, uh, I don't know, let's all just say I don't know enough about, about quark nuggets to know whether or not that's something that I should expect actually to be present in. Uh, see. <laughs> Thank you from the crowd. <laughs> I believe that's right, yeah. Yeah, he's talking about QCD quark nuggets. So, let's, yeah. Oh, simps. What do I want to say about simps? No, oh, simps are interesting. Simps are interesting. I don't have, let, let me think about what I want to say about simps. So the idea is that you can have uh, additional, you can have additional simp miracles uh, that look a lot like a Maybe let's wait and do the wimp miracle first, and then I'll talk about that. But that's a reasonable point. That's a reasonable point. Um, good. So one of the critical questions that you need to ask about in dark matter is how did it get to be here? How did it form? And so unsurprisingly, we've used this word a lot. You can have thermal, and you can have non-thermal. So thermal, at least for the moment, what I mean is, is that at some point in the history of the universe, dark matter was in equilibrium. And as we discussed before, equilibrium could mean a lot of things. I mean chemical equilibrium. I mean where you can actually change the dark matter number in the early universe. And that is an equilibrium uh, um, described by an equilibrium distribution. Then you can have non-thermal, where you have, for instance, the decay of a heavier particle. You could have a phase transition. Or you could have it produced produced from the plasma, but never actually in thermal equilibrium. So I might have processes where, say, like E plus E minus goes to dark matter, but Dark matter never reaches equilibrium. Now, I say this, and I want to just put, again, this emphasize this idea that is that this word thermal gets used a lot, and it's not often well-defined what it means. So in particular, people will often talk about this type of process. So say E plus E minus producing dark matter, or glue glue producing dark matter, something like that. And it will not reach equilibrium, but it's coming produced from the standard model thermal bath, and people will call that thermal production. Okay? The m model, the particle, will never reach thermal equilibrium. So in principle, then, you can have a situation where you have thermally produced non-thermal dark matter. So just be very, very careful right? when you read this word thermal, what people mean. When I say thermal, I'm really going to try to mean it was an equilibrium okay, of some type. So, Yeah, so a sterile neutrino would be an example of something which is uh, thermally produced non-thermal dark matter. The axino is an example of something which is thermally produced non-thermal dark matter. So stuff where interactions of the thermal bath produces these things, but they never actually reach equilibrium. So, so what I want to do now, if we're going to talk about this, I want to start by talking about this category. So I'm going to talk about dark matter that was in equilibrium. And so that leads you to start with this category of WIMP. See, this is why we have to be uh, careful. So, so I'm not going to use this, this language of talking about things which are thermally produced and, and are non-thermal. If I say something is thermal, then I'm going to mean it was in equilibrium. 
just to be clear. But I am going to say to you that you will read papers where people will say that you have dark matter particles that were thermally produced. And if in the back of your mind you're thinking that thermal production means thermal equilibrium, then you could lead yourself to be confused how the mechanics of that model works. So just be ready to let go of that word as you read these papers and just be clear on what people are talking about. They always have it in the equations, right? Um, and it's just different people use these words to, in different ways. And there's nothing wrong with saying that it's thermally produced. You mean it's produced out of the thermal bath. But it's not itself a thermal equilibrium state. I have no, I have no issue with the actual language of, of saying that. Um, but I'm just giving you some warning so that if you read these things or you hear people say these things that you don't necessarily carry along the baggage of something which is in equilibrium when somebody says the word thermal. Okay, so let's talk about thermal dark matter. So that is dark matter at the weak scale, at least at the moment. That's where we're going to start. So let me start with this slide aside, okay? Because I think that there is this, this point, and I'm going to repeat an argument that was essentially made by Chang and Lo, which I think is a very nice argument about dark matter at the weak scale. So we all have heard about the hierarchy problem, right? So you have, for instance, loops of top quarks that correct the Higgs boson mass. And you want something to cancel that off. And, and so that thing that cancels it off can be all sorts of stuff, right? It could be supersymmetry. It could be compositeness. It could be extra dimensions, which is also sort of like compositeness. But the point is, is that whatever this does, you expect there to be some scale, lambda of new physics, new particles that are cutting this off. New particles or unparticles if you, they don't actually have some sort of particle-like spectrum. And along with that, you expect there to be new operators. So some standard model operators to some power divided by this new physics scale. Okay, so. In general, you start producing all these new operators because it's got to talk to tops, it's got to talk to Higgses. It doesn't have to, but let's just say it does. And so, for instance, you can imagine getting an operator that looks like this. Okay? And this operator um, is dead if this is a TV scale because this is just going to kill you with your precision electro weak. Okay? And this is something you worry about. You say, if I have a generic new physics scale of a TeV, I want to solve the hierarchy problem, so I believe there are new states around the TeV scale, and then I start writing down all these new operators at the weak scale involving the Higgs bosons, involving gauge bosons, involving quarks and leptons, then in general, it must be a very, very, very non-generic set of new operators suppressed by the TeV scale that is not going to be excluded by all the things that we know from indirect measurements about the standard model. And so the point that Chang and Lo made was that you can help yourself by noting that, well, an operator like this, which is suppressed by, say, 1 over lambda squared, is bad, right? But an operator that looks like this is bad divided by 16 pi squared. So, if you can arrange for all of your new physics to come in in some situation where you have to pair produce the particles, then that means that all of your new operators are coming about from loops as opposed to tree level, or at least you've killed a lot of the tree level processes and maybe you've made your theory a lot safer. And so these precision operators are suppressed by this additional loop factor, and your theory in some sense is more naturally safe. You've done something to the theory that has sort of just automatically helped you quite a bit by getting rid of a lot of these tree-level suppressed operators. But if you want to make sure that all these new particles, or at least a lot of your new particles, come only in pairs, then that's equivalent to saying that you've added a Z2 symmetry to your theory, where many, 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 many of these new particles that you've added are 
odd under this Z2 symmetry, so they always appear in pairs. And you can make that a more complicated theory, but at the very least, a Z2 symmetry. And so this is what they call T-parity. And they took this parity to be minus 1 to the twice spin plus 3b plus l. They called it T-parity. And this then tells you that the lightest particle, which is odd under this, should be stable. And so if it's stable, then you should have a natural dark matter candidate. And I think this is a very, very nice argument. It's not rock solid. It's not, you know, you, you can violate this at various levels. But I think it's a nice point, which is that, look, if you impose a parity on your theory, then you can make it naturally safer. But as a byproduct, you should have a stable particle you should think about. And it better not be charged, because otherwise, that would be a problem. That's right. So this would be considered a generalization of our parity. So, OK, good. So you want to talk about how much of this stuff is left. And I'm not going to go into this in the detail that I thought that I would go into, because I think you can find all this stuff anywhere. But you imagine that in the early universe, there's all sorts of processes where energy and entropy get exchanged between different particles and sectors. And so the question you want to ask is, uh, what are the equilibrium abundances of these new particles? And how long do they stay in equilibrium? So, Because the universe is not in equilibrium now, so everything must have departed from equilibrium at some point. And I want to know what it left behind. So this is governed by the Boltzmann equation. So if f is the distribution function of your new particle, which is going to ultimately be dark matter, you have um, a Liouville operator, which describes the free evolution of a particle. Now we want is the free evolution of a particle in an expanding universe. And on the right-hand side, you have a collision term, which involves the interactions of that particle with everything else. In the no-collision case, you can then simplify this. And where h is the, the Hubble constant. And you can solve this and find, as you expect, the number density should just be diluting like a to the minus 3. That's this a term. But what you're interested in is a situation where there's a non-trivial collision term. So let's consider the process where it's a 2 to 2 process. And then the Boltzmann equation of some species psi looks like this. So x, x bar here can be some standard model state or whatever you want, but this is just a situation where psi is annihilating into x and x is annihilating into psi. And you have a process, so this is the free evolution. This is telling you that as the universe expands, number density is particle dilutes. And this right-hand side is a term which, if it's zero, tells you the universe is just free expanding. And if it's not zero, it's telling you that something else is happening. And what this is telling you, if it's zero, this is a term which is trying to force the actual number density of psi to be equal to its equilibrium distribution of psi. So all this is is saying that if you have a very, very large cross-section, then this particle will like to have a distribution which looks like the equilibrium distribution, okay? which shouldn't surprise you. right? That's what equilibrium is all about. Um, you usually like to rewrite this in terms of a quantity y. If you've not seen this expression y before, this is something that you should get used to. It's very, very useful, which is the number density of psi divided by s, where s is the entropy density in the limit of the relevant chemical potentials. It's rho plus p over t. But quantitatively, the entropy density is something like the number density of relativistic species. So you can think of this as something like the number density of photons. That's not exactly right, because entropy in a volume, absent phase transitions that are entropy-reducing, uh, is conserved. 
whereas um, the number density of photons in a box is not conserved. You can change the number of photons in a box. Um, but as the universe expands, this entropy density uh, should scale like volume. So if S scales like volume and N scales like volume, then what this allows you to do is to calculate a number density at some early time in the universe and then know that that number ratio is the same as the ratio now. And then as long as I know the entropy density today, then I can work out what the number density is today. This is akin to using the baryon to photon ratio. You calculate the baryon to photon ratio in the early universe. If that's the same as the baryon to photon ratio today, and I know how many photons there are, I know how many baryons there are. If I calculate the dark matter to radiation density in the early universe, and then I look at how much radiation there is today, then I know how much dark matter there is today. Using this variable allows you to write these equations in a more compact form because it essentially gets rid of that gets rid of that pesky free evolution bit. And you can write it like this, dy dx. Where this, so let me, sorry, 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 sorry. So I can rewrite now as x over y equilibrium. So x here is m over t, where m is some characteristic mass scale of the problem. It might be the mass of the psi particle. It might be some other characteristic mass scale. It's just a dimensionless time variable that you use uh, to talk about the evolution of this process. Gamma here is just the annihilation rate in equilibrium, thermally averaged annihilation rate of psi psi into standard model stuff or into the other equilibrium bath. And so what this says is that y will essentially be constant. y will want to force itself. If this gamma is large compared to h, y will be forced into its equilibrium abundance. Right? If the right-hand side is 0, y does not change. dy dx vanishes. And that tells you that the number density compared to the entropy density is set. And after that point, it's just diluting as the universe expands. If the right-hand side is not 0, then this is trying to force you into an equilibrium distribution, the y divided by the equilibrium distribution. And that equilibrium distribution can be, of course, falling off exponentially if this is a non-relativistic particle. But this is where this statement comes from, which is that if you have a rate which is much, much larger than the Hubble rate, then y should be approximately equal to y equilibrium. And if this is much less than h, then this right-hand side becomes effectively 0, and then dy dx is uh, just free evolution. Okay? So this is the statement of freeze-out. In the early universe, you have processes that keep your number density in whatever the equilibrium distribution happens to be. At some point, those processes become weak, or maybe they don't, but under the assumption those processes become weak compared to the Hubble rate at some point. Well. If that process is then happening less than a uh, Hubble time, then you drop out of equilibrium and you just are left with the number density that you had at that time. And the way you test this always, or the way you shorthand this, is the expression I wrote before, which is just to write that you write n sigma v is equal to h, and this is your test of freeze out. Right? Under what circumstances is the annihilation rate greater than or less than the Hubble rate. If the annihilation rate is greater than the Hubble rate, then before dark matter, then dark matter will have a chance to annihilate before the universe expands. If the Hubble rate is greater than the dark matter annihilation rate, then before the dark matter has had a single chance to find another particle, the universe will have doubled in size, and the universe will have diluted, and your chances of finding a particle will have gone down measurably, and you've kind of lost your, your chance then. Yeah? Is there a reason we Well, at this point, I haven't assumed 
that it's relativistic, non-relativistic during freeze out. I'm just here assuming that it's in equilibrium. Now, <laughs> oh, um, yeah. No, at that point I'm taking a non. That's, I'm sorry. That's that's right. There I've taken a non-relativistic Liouville operator. Um, so at that level I have cheated and jumped to the conclusion that it should be a cold dark matter model. In principle, you could do a relativistic Liouville operator, and then you would just get the same thing for a relativistic species. Um, oh, uh, I'm sorry. No, no, this is right. This is right. What am I saying? This is right. This is right. Even for a, rel or not a relativistic species. I'm talking about number density here. Number density of relativistic species also is redshifting like a to the minus 3. This is right. Here, I don't believe I've assumed anything. I think we need to have a For, oh, 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 you mean for the Hubble constant? Oh. Um, so I can always use this variable if I have, if I have some thermal bath which is characterized by T, uh, then I can always have that to be uh, a, a fine time variable. So I can use, even if, even if I'm in matter domination, if I have some, uh, if I have some, because the correlation, uh, the one that comes from the conservation of A goes like 1 over T. Right. So then, are you really able to change that bubble? That's the first equation, so that's related with rho. Oh, you're probably right. I might have assumed that in here. That equation, you have the derivative of the time. I've converted it into a, yeah, so you're right. I've cheated when I said that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, no, the, 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 the logic of it is the same, regardless whether you're in matter radiation domination, but the actual coefficients could be the same. Just, no, 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 just in the sense of when you change the x variable and you put in the Hubble constant, there is a, because there's a dndt over there, right? So you need to convert t into temperature, and so there's a temperature time relationship, and then that's dependent on whether you're in matter domination or radiation domination, but it's not going to change the, the consequences of the expression. So, this is freeze out, and so now we can talk about WIMPs and thermal relic dark matter. So, the idea here, and I'm sure you've all, or many of you have seen this before, is just that you have some process by which the standard model and dark matter stays in equilibrium. If the number density of dark matter in equilibrium is dropping exponentially, so I'm assuming here that there's no chemical potential, then what's going to happen is that if you look at this variable, say n chi divided by n gamma, it's going to be at very, very early times, it's going to be approximately constant. And then as time goes on, you're going to get to a point where x is approximately equal to 1, so the temperature drops below the mass. And then this particle will start exponentially falling out of equilibrium. And if it could stay in equilibrium forever, this exponential would become very, 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 very small. But at some point, freeze out happens, and you no longer track the equilibrium distribution. And at that point, the ratio between the number density and the photon density is just constant. So. If you have a low sigma v, if your cross-section is small, then you drop out of equilibrium very, very early, and there's a lot of dark matter. If you have a cross-section which is in the middle, then you drop out later. And if you have a very high cross-section, you drop out even later. So there's some Goldilocks point between the very high cross-section and the very low cross-section where you get the appropriate amount of dark matter, right? So you can say, all right, this here is the amount of dark matter that we want to have today. Yeah. So setting the chemical potentials, you, you can't uh, necessarily. Um, setting chemical potential to, to, to uh, non-zero is to say that you believe that there's some primordial dark matter number somewhere. Um, so 
when I set the chemical potential to zero, I'm basically saying I'm going to consider the class of problems where either that primordial abundance is small or the particle is its own antiparticle, which is a fairly generic class of models. Uh, because there you can't have a, a chemical potential. Or your chemical potential is zero, is another way of putting it. If you want to consider situations where there is chemical potential, then that is essentially you're talking about asymmetric dark matter, which is in, a, an interesting and... Uh, and Yeah, well, so, so, the, so, so the question about where the chemical potential would come from is a valid one. But I can't necessarily say from the outset that dark matter is not going to have a chemical potential. It could. I don't know where it came from, but it might have a chemical potential. But it doesn't have to, so it's certainly interesting to study that case. And if it's an antiparticle, it won't. So this discussion is limited to uh, a set of cases, which is a pretty big set of cases. Yeah. That's right. Well, if you're, if you're chemically coupled, you will stay kinetically coupled. If, if dark matter is going back and forth in general, not 100%, but in general, you will stay uh, kinetically coupled. Um, yeah. Usually, the kinetic decoupling happens a bit later than the chemical decoupling. Um, right. So let's talk about this very schematically, because we don't have a ton of time. And I think that you can understand this so-called WIMP miracle, as people like to refer to it, in very, very general terms. So how does this go? The argument goes like this. n sigma v is equal to h at freeze out, right? And h is equal to t squared over m Planck, if this is radiation domination. And that is equal to m squared over m Planck where m is m psi. Now, that's not right up to the level of factors of 10, but it is going to be approximately right, in the sense that once dark matter becomes non-relativistic, I am going to become exponentially suppress the number density of dark matter. So I don't need e to the minus a billion to suppress the dark matter density. Maybe I need to suppress it by e to the 10, e to the minus 10, or maybe I need to suppress it by e to the minus 20 or e to the minus 30. But in any of those cases, this t is going to be m divided by 20, or m divided by 30, or m divided by 40. I'm not going to have to go to m divided by 10 to the 6 to make sure that there's not enough dark matter around that it can couple. So c and m will be similar to each other. Not exactly the same, but similar to each other. So uh, what I want to do then is I want to take this number density, and I want to redshift it to a later time where I know something about how much dark matter is in the universe. So the number density at freeze out is m squared over sigma v m Planck, which tells me then that rho at freeze out is m cubed over sigma v m Planck. And then I want to take that and I want to redshift that energy density from freeze out to a later time. And in particular, I want to redshift it to the time of matter radiation equality, which is where I know something. So redshifting this from at matter radiation equality is to take this quantity and multiply it by a dilution factor, but that dilution factor is whatever the temperature at matter radiation equality is divided by m cubed, right? I want to dilute it by a factor of a cubed. a is the ratio between the temperature then and the temperature at matter radiation equality. The temperature then is m. Temperature of matter radiation quality is temperature of matter radiation quality. So this is just a ratio of the scale factor at early times divided by the scale factor at matter radiation equality. But those things then cancel, and you find that the energy density at matter radiation equality is, is just this. Right? So the first thing to note is the interesting fact that this does not depend at all explicitly on the mass of the dark matter particle, right? The energy density of dark matter at matter radiation quality only depends on the annihilation cross-section, okay? So that's the first thing. This tells us, this assumption about dark matter, that it is a, an equilibrium thermal relic, tells us precisely one thing, and that one thing that it tells us is 
the annihilation cross section at freeze out. So, yeah, it depends on the model, but yeah, 20, 30. So you're squaring those, so like it's not like oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm getting big, big, okay. big factors uh, there. But those are just going to be coefficients out front. They're not going to actually, this x factor is only logarithmically sensitive to these parameters, so it's just some number. So, so if I want to say, so this is rho at t matter radiation equality is this. Then I'm setting this equal to the energy density of matter radiation equality, but the energy density of matter radiation equality is just t to the fourth times pi squared over 30, but that's basically the same thing certainly at the level of approximation that I'm working right now. And so there are different ways of writing this. I can say this then tells me that T matter radiation equality is, is this, 1 over sigma v times 1 m Planck. And then if I assume that sigma v is equal to 1 over, or if I assume that sigma v is equal to alpha squared over some scale lambda, then this is, make sure I get my alphas in the right place. Is this, or equivalently, I can say that this gets me the right answer if the scale lambda is approximately equal to t and Planck times t matter radiation quality. So, this, I claim, is what people refer to as the Wimp miracle. Okay? The Wimp miracle is the statement that if you start with a thermal relic, the matter radiation equality scale is equal to, essentially, the seesaw scale, lambda squared over m Planck, with some boost from this alpha factor. Okay? But we happen to know that the matter radiation equality scale is approximately an EV, and the seesaw scale that that's appropriate for is where lambda is approximately equal to the weak scale. So you can turn this around and you can say that if you assume that your cross section is set by some perturbative coupling set by a dimensionful scale, then that scale is the geometric mean of the Planck scale and the matter radiation equality scale. And that geometric mean is approximately the weak scale. So this is a way of talking about the Wimp miracle. It's telling you that if you just want a thermal relic to give you the right scale of matter radiation equality, then the scale that should be characteristic of that cross-section should be approximately weak scale. Okay. But this is sort of, I think, a more, at least to me, intuitive way of writing it, because it's writing it in terms of a quantity that has nothing to do with dark matter now. It has to do with dark matter when it was uh, at a specific point in its history, when matter radiation was equal. But this is the way miracle. You start with a thermal relic. You go through this process, and you end up with motivation for a weak scale particle. So why is this a miracle? Well, on the one hand, you say that new physics tells me I have all these motivations for new physics at the weak scale. And we just said that the safest model should have stable particles. So what would they be? And over here, I say, if I just ask questions about an equilibrium universe with weak scale particles in them, or with dark matter in it, what scale do I need for that to be the dark matter that we observe? And the answer is weak scale. So I have this stuff over here, which is telling me that I should be interested in the weak scale, and this stuff over here that's telling me that I should be interested in the weak scale. And together, they both point to the same value-ish, and so I call that a miracle. This is not a very strong miracle. This is not a call the Pope miracle. This is like Madonna on toast miracle, I think. <laughs> Because there are a lot of order one parameters in here, right? This alpha can be lots of things. This lambda, if it's a TeV, you'll call that weak scale. If it's 100 GeV, you'll call that weak scale. I could probably go down to 10 GeV, and you'll still let me call that weak scale. There are pi's, all sorts of things in here that allow me to vary this. But it is still interesting, and it is instructive that, uh, that these scales are close enough together to, to motivate further consideration. And that's what we will start tomorrow with. All right, I'll stop there. <laughs>